Before we get started, I have a quick favor. I've been self-funding the Finding Genius podcast for five years now. I've done over 3,000 episodes. And as you can see on YouTube, we're up over a million views on the channel, which is fantastic. The next thing I really want to push on is to get up to 10,000 subscribers. Because once we do, we'll be able to put a donate button and uh, we'll be able to solicit donations to help keep the podcast running and to also get the Finding Genius Foundation moving along. We have a big project studying anxiety, depression, and PTSD and working on a product to help people overcome these problems because I've seen them explode recently after the, the last two years of the whole virus situation. So if you would, please subscribe to the podcast. That would help us tremendously give us a thumbs up and check in the description for buy me a coffee it's about five bucks if you could buy me a coffee i'd really appreciate it It would help keep the channel going and i love coffee thank you forget frequently asked questions common sense common knowledge or google how about advice from a real genius 95 percent of people in any profession are good enough to be qualified and licensed five percent go above and beyond they become very good at what they do but only 0.1 percent a real Jesus. Richard Jacobs has made it his life's mission to find them for you. He hunts down and interviews geniuses in every field. Sleep science, cancer, stem cells, ketogenic diets, and more. Here come the geniuses. This is the Finding Genius Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Before we begin, a note from our sponsor. I'm Richard Jacobs, Executive Director of the nonprofit Finding Genius Foundation and host of the Finding Genius Podcast. In late 2016, I was rear-ended at 65 miles an hour by a truck on the highway, which sent me off-road into a ditch. The impact of the collision gave me a concussion and other injuries. At the hospital, a CT scan showed that I had thyroid nodules, which turned out to be cancer. It was then, when I had a biopsy in my neck, that I realized, even if I was a millionaire, I wouldn't want a second or a third biopsy due to the pain and the invasiveness of it. And appointments at that time for thyroid experts were three to six months out. And I was worried about dying now, even if that was irrational. So because of this, I've decided to raise money to conduct a literature review on steroids, on the causes of anxiety and depression, a condition that affects well over 50 million people in the United States and hundreds of millions worldwide. Our goal is to create a codex, a guide that reveals all possible treatments for anxiety and depression for people that live with the condition or for loved ones that have it, as my wife and my son do. To find out more about our fundraiser, visit FindingGeniusFoundation.org and click on Current Initiatives. And now, to our guest. Hello, this is Richard Jacobs with the Finding Genius Podcast. I have Paul Shapiro. He's the CEO of Better Meat. Um, we're going to talk about what Better Meat does and uh, Paul's background and how, I don't know how to call it, but I guess uh, lab-grown meat uh, will compete with, uh, with, with regular meat. So, Paul, thanks for coming. Richard, how you doing, my man? I'm doing good. Yeah, it's nice to meet you. Oh, very good, very good. Let's get to the meat of the matter. Tell me a bit about your background and how did you end up in this industry and forming this company or being the CEO of this company? Sure. So if you think about, Richard, the fact that the planet is not getting any bigger, and then you contemplate the fact that humanity's footprint on the planet is getting bigger, you realize that we need to do something. Because one of the primary ways that we leave our that footprint is through our food print, principally in the amounts of meat that we eat. It just takes a lot of land a lot of water, a lot of greenhouse gas emissions and more to raise and slaughter billions and billions of animals for food. And the problem is we have 8 billion of us on the planet. Most of the people on the planet want to be eating more meat, not less. And we're going to add another couple billion people to the planet in the next 30 years. So again, if the planet isn't getting any bigger, how are we going to feed ourselves sustainably into the future without just destroying the rest of the planet, raising the rest of the forests and so on? And so what I have devoted much of my life to is figuring out how we can wean humanity off of this addiction that we have to raising and slaughtering animals for food. Uh, if we're going to solve the climate crisis, we have to wean ourselves off of fossil fuels and wean ourselves off of animal agriculture. And so with fossil fuels, you know, there's lots of ways to get energy without fossil fuels, wind, solar, geothermal, nuclear, etc. Uh, similarly, with animal agriculture, there's lots of ways to recreate the meat experience without animals. You can grow plants like soybeans or yellow peas or wheat and turn them into things that look like animal meat. Or you can do what we at the Better Meat Co are doing, which is not to go to plants, but to use microbial fermentation, to take a little microscopic fungi and subject them to a fermentation that creates a meat experience that is really indistinguishable from a type of meat experience that you currently have. 
uh, except for the tiny little fraction of the footprint on the planet on animals and on public health. And so I'd love to talk more about that, but in a nutshell, Richard, that's what we're doing. We're creating the meat experience, but without animals. How long currently from start to finish does it take for you to, you know, produce meat that, uh, that can get to the customer and be sold versus traditional methods? Sure. So think about it like right now with the cow. If you are going to raise a cow and slaughter that cow for food, you're going to be feeding her for nearly two years, depending on what style of production. It could be anywhere from like 14 to 24 months or so. Um, that's a lot of time, a lot of money, a lot of resources, you need a lot of land and water and so on. However, with our little microscopic fungi, we inoculate our fermenter and then we harvest our fermenter in less than one single day. We can go from inoculation to harvest in about 20 hours. And so this is a tiny fraction of the land and water that's needed to raise animals for food, while at the same time producing an experience for the end consumer that is really identical. Well, what, what are you producing? Are you producing currently, you know, in the future, I'm sure it'll be maybe a, like a burger, but, uh, you know, a burger-sized piece of, of meat. But what are you producing right now? Like within 20 hours or 24 hours, what can you produce versus, uh, you know, again, what I would get in the store or getting a hamburger, et cetera? Yeah, sure, Richard. So if you think about um, the production time, it really is just going to depend on the, – the volume is dependent on how big your fermenter is. And so at the Better Meat Co. in Sacramento, we have built what is really what we call the largest mycoprotein fermentation facility in America. And so we have fermenters that stretch three stories into the, in, into the air, and we can produce thousands of pounds of product. So we're not you know, producing one burger at a time here. We're producing lots and lots of burgers at a time. But we are an ingredients company. We are not a company that is uh, selling burgers or steaks on the market. Rather, what we're doing is creating ingredients that we sell to food companies like Hormel Foods and others for them to utilize in their products. And so we want to create the most convincing meat experience that you can without animals and then offer that to the big food companies so that they can be in a position to reduce their own footprint on the planet by using fewer animals. So what, what are you fermenting? What's the substrate? And again, what, what does it produce and what does it look like and taste like, et cetera? Well, for people who aren't familiar with fermentation, let me just give like a brief background. So, you know, the first food processing technique that humanity ever invented was fire, right? We started cooking food. But after that, it was fermentation. And fermentation is basically the process of taking one thing and using microbes to transform it into something else. So like when you feed a cow, you know, you're feeding, let's say, the cow corn. And through a process of fermentation with inside of that animal's body, you end up making a steak. So you put in corn, you get out steak. Well, what we do is we put in very simple, low-value agricultural byproducts that we are upcycling and putting that into a fermentation system where we have our own microbes that feast on it, and then they grow up into something that is called a mycoprotein. That's M-Y-C-O protein. And that mycoprotein really has a meat-like texture. On its own, in addition to a meat-like texture, it also has more protein than eggs, more iron than beef, more potassium than bananas, more fiber than oats, and it naturally contains vitamin B12, just like animal-based meat does. And so we are producing a product now that is superior to meat on an environmental standpoint, on a health standpoint, and it offers the same experience that people are accustomed to having when they put the food into their mouth. Well, same experience. So is, is it making a patty? Uh, like what, what kind of experience? Are you, are you making a hot dog-like structure? Are you making a burger-like structure? Like what does it look like? Actually, we did make hot dogs just yesterday. Um, and so we can do everything from burgers and sausages and dogs to steaks and chicken breasts and foie gras and more. How? Like, what's the difference between a, uh, I don't know, a burger of one cut versus another? You know, a ground beef type texture versus uh, a steak. You know, uh, how is it different? It's going to be partially in how we flavor it, partially in how we cut it, and partially in how we hydrate it. All right, so you're replicating, you think, successfully, like, the mouth feel of eating meat and the taste? Or, like, you know, what, what are the elements that go into what makes a, uh, a burger that's satisfying to someone versus not? What have you discovered? Um, in short, what you need to do is make sure that you're getting the right ratio of flavor, fats, and, and uh, protein. So, you know, typically when people eat a burger, let's say it's, like, 80-20. So it's 80% muscle, 20% fat. 
And so with our mycoprotein, it has virtually no fat in it whatsoever. So we have to add fat. And so the key is adding fat in a way that delivers the same type of mouthfeel that you get from a conventional beef burger. And so we're adding different blends of fats to make sure that when we combine the fat with our mycoprotein and then form it into a patty and flavor it like a hamburger, that you're not going to be able to tell the difference. Before we continue, I've been personally funding the Finding Genius podcast for four and a half years now, which has led to 2,700 plus interviews of clinicians, researchers, scientists, CEOs, and other amazing people who are working to advance science and improve our lives and our world. Even though this podcast gets 100,000 plus downloads a month, we need your help to reach hundreds of thousands more worldwide. Please visit FindingGeniusPodcast.com and click on Support Us. We have three levels of membership from 10 to $49 a month, including perks such as the ability to see ahead in our interview calendar and ask questions of upcoming guests, transcripts of podcasts you're interested in, the ability to request specific topics or guests, and more. Visit FindingGeniusPodcast.com and click Support Us today. Now, back to the show. Oh, where does the uh, fat come from then? Uh, so we can use various fats, whether canola oil, sunflower oil, coconut oil, and so on. But typically, we'll blend them together. Okay, so it's a blend of, uh, of I guess it sounds like different vegetable oils that constitute the fat portion of the meat. Yeah, that's exactly right. Okay, so what are some of the easy things to make, and what have so far been some of the difficult things to make and emulate? Well, the, the lower bar in the plant-based meat world is to mimic uh, ground meat. So hamburgers, sausages, meatballs, chicken nuggets, and so on. Not that it's easy to do, but it is a lower bar than doing what's called whole muscle cuts, like a steak or a chicken breast and so on. And so that really is uh, what's considered like the holy grail in the ultimate movement. And um, that's just a harder thing to do because a steak is is... It has connective tissues. It's got other things in there that really give it a, a unique mouthfeel. And it's hard to do, um, but we're doing it. And we have a great team of chefs, food scientists, culinary experts, and more who work together to take this product, our mycoprotein that we call Ryza, and put it into a product a formulation that is going to satisfy even the most diehard carnivore. So what are some of the, uh, I don't know, the differences so far when people have tested your meat versus uh, traditional meat, what do they say? Is it, can they not tell the difference or is it very different? Is it satisfying? Uh, there are, yeah, there are some applications where you really can't tell the difference. So for example, if you, we've done focus groups where we do back-to-back -back turkey bacon and our mycelium or our mycoprotein bacon, and people can't really tell the difference. It's pretty hard to tell. When you do other applications, uh, like let's say crab cakes, it's also pretty hard to tell. But there are other things that are harder um, the, to, to mimic. And so, for example, um, while our, our steak is good, it's not identical to, let's say, a filet mignon. And so we've got to keep working to make that happen. Uh, what about uh, price point? What's the difference between uh, something that you guys make and you know, buying it from a, you know, a regular purveyor? In short, if you think about right now animal-based meat, which is going up in price, it's still, even though it's going up in price, it's typically sold under the cost of plant-based meat. Uh, Animal-based meat typically is more affordable than plant-based. One of the key innovations that we at the Better Meat Co. have been pioneering is that we can produce our mycelium for roughly the same cost as beef. And so rather than having a product that is going to be selling at multiples over the cost of meat, instead we can sell at the cost of beef here because and still uh, have a margin on the product. Uh, so this is just one of the advantages by going to microbial fermentation rather than using plant protein isolates in order to achieve this uh, meat-like experience. Are you able to, uh, I mean, in terms of the scale that you would need to do to, to make this, again, completely affordable and a replacement for sources of meat, like how, how much bigger would you have to get? What would it take? A lot bigger, Richard, a lot bigger. So, you know, right now we can produce like thousands of pounds of the product, but we really need to be able to produce tens of millions of pounds at a minimum. And that's going to take time. We have to build a full-scale factory. And so in Sacramento, we are now operating our demonstration scale plant, where again, we have fermenters that go three stories into the air, but that's great. And we're partnered with companies like Hormel. We've received patent protection and more. 
but we need to build a full scale plant that's about 30 times bigger. And that's gonna cost us tens of millions of dollars to do. And so in order to obtain that capital, we are going to open up a financing round to invite investors who want to come in on this, to invest in the company and own a piece of the future of meat. And so we already have the land picked out in the Midwest where we want to build our next facility, but we need to scale up and we need to scale up fast. We need to produce a river of our mycoprotein to flow through the food industry to create a more sustainable, more humane, healthier way to sustainably feed humanity into the future. If you like this podcast, please click the link in the description to subscribe and review us on iTunes. Would it be helpful to mix in some regular um, animal products with your burgers to, you know, to get them out the door faster or to bulk them up, and then maybe in the future just go all, um, all you know, all fermentation, or um, is that against your ethics, or what are your thoughts there? So we actually uh, currently do something similar to what you're mentioning, Richard. So we sell our ingredients to Purdue Farms, the major chicken company, and they blend it into their chicken nuggets. So they sell a 50-50 mm. half plant-based, half chicken nugget. It's called Purdue Chicken Plus. It's on the market. You can go buy it now. It's in Walmart and, and everywhere else. But Purdue Chicken Plus was rated by the Food Network as the best tasting frozen chicken nugget in America. So, you know, you're talking about a product that's only half chicken, and yet it's the best tasting frozen chicken nugget in America, according to Food Network. And it shows that the idea that you just proposed, Richard, of hybridization really can work. Yeah, no, that's re- that's really cool. Um, what are your thoughts about that model, though? Is it just, a, you know, obviously a stopgap on the road towards 100% mycoprotein or... Do you think it'll be a good thing going forward for quite a long time to do this? Well, I think that we're going to have animal-based meat for a long time, just in the way I think we're going to have, you know, gas-powered cars for a long time. And so I'm supportive of having hybrid cars that use a combination of both gas and electricity. And I'm similarly supportive of meat being hybridized as well, so that we can have uh, lower footprint meat on the market too. But yeah, eventually I do think that, you know, decades into the future, we'll be all electric in our vehicles. And just like I think decades into the future, we will not uh, have this system where we're slaughtering billions upon billions of animals for food anymore. Um, but it's going to take time. You know, it's going to take time. It took a long time, just as, as an example, to move, let's say, from whale oil to kerosene and then eventually to electricity. But we were slaughtering whales for centuries prior mm. to the invention of kerosene, which really decimated the whaling industry. Just in the same way that we used horse-drawn carriages for centuries, and in fact, millennia prior to the invention of the car. And I do see... Uh, the alternative meat movement as offering innovations that are similar to these other innovations, whether cars or kerosene, et cetera, that we will be displacing categories of our types of animal exploitation with new animal-free innovations that are going to be better for the planet and better for us. All right. So you seem to have the attitude of, hey, you know, for doing half-half, that's fine, whatever works, you're still having a big impact. Oh, yeah, for sure. Look, I don't want to let the perfect be the enemy of the good. Uh, If we could reduce the amount of animals we're raising for food by 50%, the environmental benefits would be dramatic. Right now, raising animals for food is the number one cause of deforestation on the planet. The number one reason the Amazon rainforest is being cut and burned down is because of humanity's desire for meat. And so if we're concerned about climate change, if we're concerned about wildlife extinction, if we're concerned about keeping some semblance of the natural world still intact, we need to cut down on the number of animals who are using for food. And so, yes, if we could effectuate a 50% reduction in that number, what a great service to the world that would be. Yeah, no, that's excellent. You know, some of the uh, the competitors out there that, again, are using plant isolates and all that to make make their products um, what do you see as some of the issues that they're having that, uh, that you can learn from so that you don't fall into the same trap? Well, I mean, a few things. One, some of these companies like Beyond Meat and Impossible Foods have been very successful. So I wouldn't necessarily call it a trap because these companies have done, mm. have done pretty well. Um, at the same time, there is a limitation. Like Beyond Meat is relying on pea protein. And peas, of course, are cheaper than beef. But a pea protein burger is more expensive for a variety of reasons, one of which is that you're not using the whole pea. You're using a tiny little fraction of the pea that contains the protein, so you need a lot more peas to make that burger. It's still way more efficient than raising cows for food, but what we at the Better Meat Co. are doing by using our mycoprotein is using a whole food. So we're not using the equivalent just of like the entire pea. We're using the entire pea plant, and so the, the, the really the equivalent thereof. 
And so I, that's one of the ways that we get the cost down is by doing what's called whole biomass fermentation, which is a method of creating a meat-like experience by actually growing a whole food in a fermenter. Yeah, no, that's excellent. In terms of cost, uh, I guess the 50-50 product obviously already is perfectly viable, and that's why you're able to sell it and it's being used. Is it a big leap in terms of cost to go to 100% mycoprotein? Well, it would be a scale-up issue, right? So you would have to uh, create millions of liters of fermentation capacity that don't currently exist. At the same time, you know, we're not going to have to rely only on mycoprotein in the same way we're not going to rely only on, let's say, wind energy, right? You also have solar and geothermal and nuclear and all these other low-carbon methods of producing energy. And so at, well, mycoprotein is one way to do this. It's one ore in the water. You're also going to have plant proteins, uh, and you're going to have what's called cultivated meat, which is real meat grown from animal cells rather than from animal slaughter. So right now, these are like really the three methods of recreating the meat experience without animals, is using plant proteins, using mycoprotein, and using animal cells. And I think a combination of those three is going to be what's needed in order to truly satiate humanity's meat tooth without animals. Meat tooth. <laughs> Instead of a sweet tooth, that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. I'm glad you got. I'm glad you got the joke, Richard. Well, you know, as you can see from the beginning of the podcast, I like the, uh, the dad jokes. So if we can apply them <laughs> in this industry, we're, we'll all be better off. I think. Uh, I am a uh, I am a big fan of dad jokes, much to the chagrin of many of my coworkers. Um, and so uh, I, I'll see how many more I can work in here. But for because I'm into chemistry, I always think, uh, even if nobody's laughing at my jokes, I just keep on telling them until I get a reaction. You know how you'll know you've truly won is if uh, one of the employees goes, Dad, I mean, uh, I mean, uh, Mr. Simon, you know, they, they get confused like that. Then you can really, then you really know you've won. <laughs> That's really funny. That would be a great day for me. Yeah. Well, excellent. Um. I don't know. What do, you, what do you see as happening over the next uh, year or two in your industry? Like you said, you're going to be raising money to expand capacity. But, you know, is there, are there other innovations that you have in the pipeline that you can discuss that uh, you think you're going to make things a lot better and more scalable? Yeah, you know, plant-based meat has primarily been focused on burgers, sausages, and chicken nuggets. And I think there's going to be a lot more entrance into the marketplace for new products, whether they be bacon, crab cakes, fish sticks. Like, I think there's just going to be a broader diversification of the products that are going to come out on the market that are going to be animal-free. Okay. Well, what's the best place for people to experience your product, and what's the best place for people to find out more about what you're working on? Well, you can uh, get the Purdue Chicken Nuggets pretty much anywhere, Walmart, Whole Foods, etc. But to find out more about what we're working on at the Better Meat Co., please check out bettermeat.co. Again, that's bettermeat.co. And get in touch with us. If you're interested in owning a piece of this company as we create the future of meat, we'd love to talk with you. If you want to work for us, we are uh, hiring. And uh, if you're interested in a book that I wrote on the topic, it's called Clean Meat, How Growing Meat Without Animals Will Revolutionize Dinner and the World. You can get it anywhere the books are sold, including Amazon, uh, but also the book's official website is just cleanmeat.com. Again, that's cleanmeat.com. Oh, and I, I wanted to give uh, tips to the listeners. So, if uh, someone is really like feeling the impact of the higher prices of everything, but especially meat, uh, is there a quick alternative that they can go to? Is there anything they can do to, to help themselves? Um, yeah, so uh, it's funny that you asked that, Richard, because my wife actually runs a great resource called Plant Based on a Budget. So go to plantbasedonabudget.com and you can check it out. She also has a great cookbook called Plant Based on a Budget, which shows you how to eat plant-based and save a lot of money in the process. So it's a great way to not only do right by your health and by the planet, but also by your wallet. Yeah, no, that's excellent. And then the last thing I want to ask you is, um, I should have asked you early on in the podcast, but are there any um, preconceptions or urban myths or, you know, again, th these kind of attitudes that you have to combat? You know, you have to say the same thing over and over and over, and you're like, oh, geez, everyone's thinking this way and I have to explain myself a hundred times, anything like that that comes up in your, in your daily existence. You know, I do think with mycoprotein that it, it, people are not as familiar with fungi-based proteins as they are with animal protein or even plant-based protein. And so it does require a little bit of an explanation. People are generally pretty enthusiastic about trying it, um, but most people don't think about protein as coming from fungi. And so that does require some explanation. And a lot of the times people think that you're talking about mushrooms because they think of fungi and mushrooms as synonyms, whereas it's not really true. 
Uh, a mushroom is the fruiting body of the fungi, but we do not grow mushrooms here at, at Amico. Mm -hmm. We are growing what's called mycelium, or like the root-like structure that goes underneath the, underneath the ground. And so that's what we grow, and that does require a little bit of information and education from time to time. Okay. Well, very good. Paul, again, it's been really great to talk to you. And thank you for what you're doing and for, for this call. I appreciate it. Awesome. Really nice to talk with you, Richard. Thanks again. If you like this podcast, please click the link in the description to subscribe and review us on iTunes. You've been listening to the Finding Genius Podcast with Richard Jacobs. If you like what you hear, be sure to review and subscribe to the Finding Genius Podcast on iTunes or wherever you listen to podcasts. And want to be smarter than everybody else? Become a premium member at FindingGeniusPodcast.com. This podcast is for information only. No advice of any kind is being given. Any action you take or don't take as a result of listening is your sole responsibility. Consult professionals when advice is needed.